Today I'm going to serve myself a big heaping spoonful of humble pie as I bring some of my favorite projects back into the shop and see how they fared over time. You know, I remember when I first started woodworking, how disappointed I was when I noticed that joints that were nice and smooth and flush and felt perfect when I first finished them, you know, a couple weeks, couple months later, you could start to feel little ridges and it just didn't feel as perfect as it used to. And I was really disappointed to find out that, you know, my projects were doing this. And I actually thought it was something that I was doing wrong. And then uh, there was a point where I was at David Mark's shop and we got to see a lot of his, uh, things that were in his home and the projects that I've seen on the show, the stuff that I've really admired, and I would go up and touch them. And all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, well, I can actually feel ridges here. And it sort of brought it to light that, you know what, this is normal. This is the way things happen with wood. Wood never stays still. It's by nature going to expand and contract and swell and come back down. So there are going to be times where joints that normally might feel smooth decide to lift, you know, so that they actually are uh, expanding at different rates and you could feel those ridges. And I have a ton of examples of that here. So part of my goal here today is to make sure that you understand that a lot of these things are normal and you have to expect them to happen and anticipate them happening. And we'll also go over some things that are not normal and what we could have done to prevent those things from happening. Now, first up is a mahogany bar stool. That's actually David Mark's design. Um, really great design. I think it looks great. It's very sturdy and it's held up really well over time. Now the two areas that I'll point out that could be potential issues and where you should expect issues are first of all the joints of the, uh, the little footrest here. They're not really joined to the legs with any sort of wood joinery. We use these brass dowels that connect them with just glue. Otherwise it's a butt joint, um, you know, so you can't really expect it to be perfect forever. You're gonna see some separation here over time. And that's exactly what we have. It's hairline, it's very, very tiny, but it's there. So you have to be aware that that may occur with this type of joint. The other thing is, since it's brass and this material is wood, they're gonna expand and contract at very different rates. So there's a lot of times, and it may change over the course of a year, depending on the season, but you should probably be able to feel that metal, either an indentation or it'll sit proud of the surface. You'll just feel it with your finger. And again, perfectly normal. Now looking at the top, here's another area where you might expect to see something uh, where these legs punch all the way through unlike some of the, uh, the furniture that I've seen at Bed Bath & Beyond where it looks like they stamp on the tenon, which is real classy. Uh, here, these actually protrude all the way through. And since the grain is running vertical and the rest of the grain of the seed is running horizontal, you've got to expect those to expand at different rates. So you should be able to feel those ridges a few, uh, maybe even just a few weeks down the line, you'll start to feel them uh, differentiating from each other. But again, it's all normal. This is something that happens with any piece of furniture. Now, next up is my zebra wood contemplation bench. This is a fun little design, kind of different. Uh, the, the joinery itself was a little bit uh, strange. It's sort of a giant open mortise and tenon where the mortise itself is formed by the top, which is made of, well, was originally made of three separate pieces that we glued back together to create this open mortise. The tenon, which is built into the leg here, is actually screwed into the body of the top piece and then capped off with some wangy caps. And it has really held up pretty well. I mean, I drove some three inch screws in there, so it's certainly strong enough. Now the place where you might expect to feel some abnormalities, of course, just like with the steps or with the uh, bar stool, is this place where the end grain pushes up through the face grain of the zebra wood. Perfectly normal, and I do feel a slight ridge there. Fortunately, this material hasn't really moved very much over time, so it's in pretty good shape. Now, the other thing is we've got three pieces joined together, so you might expect if you run your finger across to feel those joints over the course of time. Fortunately, because the zebra wood has kind of an open pore structure, you don't really even know what's, what is a, a joint line and what is just the way the grain runs. So that's actually really good and it turns out to be a great wood for this type of project. Same thing goes with the legs. These legs, although they may look like one single piece of wood, it's actually made up of two because I didn't have boards that were wide enough. I was just able to match the grain in such a way that it looked like one piece of wood. But really not a whole lot to say about this piece. 
because it's very basic joinery, but uh, what we do feel on here is perfectly normal. Now what we have here is what I like to call a gadget station. It's a prototype, so I bent some of the rules. I did a few things the way I normally wouldn't do them, and it turned out to be okay, uh, but it let me know what I want to do when I do my second round of the real gadget station. But it's primarily made with Hotoba, and in a case like this with a cabinet that's going to have a lot of gadgets inside of it and chargers and things, there's a good amount of heat buildup in there. So if you make this out of solid wood, you may have a problem in the future as uh, the heat builds up, things expand and contract, it may just cause issues. So I opted to make the entire thing out of plywood, and I just made my own veneer for the Hotoba, so it gives it a really nice solid wood look. Okay, if you open it up, I could show you where I did wind up going wrong and things I'm going to fix in the future generations of this piece. But first of all, all this is ply. It's all very stable. The shelves have held up really, really nicely. Uh, the top is in really good shape. This piece here, okay, this was just a design concept. I thought when this is hanging on the wall that it might be cool if you put a laptop on there and you could da -da 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 stand there and type away, but who does that, right? I mean, you have your laptop in your office or it's sitting on your lap on the couch. It really turned out to be an interesting concept, but not really, in reality, a great idea. And one of the main issues here are these chains. Since this sheet here is actually a piece of plywood, driving a screw in there and having all this weight on there over the course of a couple years really puts a lot of strain on those layers of ply. And if you look really closely, you can see that it's pulling up. And I really think someday those screws may just pop out. So uh, that's definitely something to consider. And thankfully, this didn't go to a customer. This is just in my house, and I can monitor this, and it teaches me a lot about what to, well, in this case, what not to do in the future. Now, this piece is what I like to call an ottoman tray. We had a big ottoman in the living room and no coffee table, so you need something for uh, serving guests and things like that, and this worked really well. It's just a very simple sheet of maple ply surrounded by a carved uh, paduk frame. Now, this is one of those cases where you have to realize that anytime you encase wood in a frame, it's going to expand and it's going to blow out the joints at the corners. And that's why you need to use plywood because it's stable. Had I used solid wood, it would have been a nightmare. But since it was ply, it's nice and stable. The joints are all really tight. I actually use splines inside the joint to keep them together. So I have, I mean, these ridges, this is really good. Even if you, in most cases, you do everything right, you still will probably over the course of time feel a ridge where these miter joints are, and I don't. So we lucked out a little bit there, but you stack the cards in your favor if you do something like a spline or maybe even just biscuits across that joint. Really, really helps. The inlay here, this little sun design, inlays are always interesting uh, because they are dead flat. They feel perfect uh, when you first make them, but then eventually you really start to feel some texture differences, maybe even some low points and, and high points. And I've got a few of them here the outside of this is, is in really good shape, but uh, there's one spot right there where I could start to feel that the ply is a little bit higher and this part of the sun must have sunk down a little bit. But uh, hey, that's life. What are you going to do? And I don't even know exactly what I may have done to cause that, so I can't help you there. But the bottom line is a little bit of that is perfectly normal. Now this is one of my favorite pieces that I've ever made. It's my Asian-inspired inlaid hall table. Now the inlay on the top, much like the inlay on the serving tray, you could feel a little bit of texture here and there, perfectly normal. The top here is a piece of ply with a veneered piece of uh, uh, figured maple, and it's got a wengi trim around the outside, and it sits in a rabbit, and this beautiful uh, Hotoba frame sort of encases the whole thing. And again, you have to use ply if you're gonna encase it in a frame, otherwise you blow it out. It actually sits a little bit proud of the frame too, which is something that's a little bit unique. Uh, the one thing I really wanna point out here, and it's something we talked about in the serving tray as well, are these miters. Now over the years I've done a lot of frames and things and if you've done a lot yourself I'm sure you've noticed that they almost always seem to want to separate to some degree or another so that you know a couple years down the line run your finger there and you feel that they've moved a little bit and judging even even just from this one ex experiment if you call it that uh, from this one particular project alone the fact that I put this wangi spline in here has kept all four of these joints dead on. I mean, perfect. I don't feel a joint at all on any of them. So that's enough evidence for me to say that anytime I do a miter joint, it is absolutely gonna be uh, supplemented by either a biscuit, a spline, or something to make sure that those are kept perfectly level for the entire life of that piece. 
and it worked really well in this one. Uh, other things that we could take a look at, uh, well, here's, here's a good lesson. Again, this was a prototype. In the future, if I were to make another one of these, I would make sure that I had the right lumber to do it. In this case, these legs required a very thick, I believe it was even a, a four by four block to, uh, to cut these compound curved legs. And in order to do that, I had to glue up multiple pieces. And what happens when you do that and you cut a leg with a curve, you sometimes, I don't know if you can see this here, but you sometimes get a wacky uh, joint where it goes from one piece to the next piece. So that doesn't look good, especially not in the front and right on this really, really visible front left leg. So in the future, that's something you wanna make sure you avoid kind of as an aside. Um, but again, prototype, so it wasn't really that big of a deal. Let's take a look at the drawer here. Now the drawer was sort of an experiment in simplicity and uh, design, you know, just trying to come up with something that wasn't dovetails, I wanted to do something unique, uh, that had a little bit of a visual interest that you don't normally see in a drawer. And that's what we wound up with, with these stainless steel uh, dowel rods that are serving just like a normal dowel, pushed straight into the, uh, the front of the piece, and there's a little strip of wangi trimming out the front edge. And it gives it kind of a unique look, and that's held up really well. I don't feel any of the, the joint at all. I do feel these metal pieces, just like in the stool. Whenever you have that metal and wood combination, it may feel perfect on day one, but it's probably not gonna feel perfect later. Okay, but all of that is perfectly normal. The drawer itself just slides into this compartment. There's no guides. The side of the uh, drawer compartment is the guide. Okay, there's a little play in there, and that was intentional. That was there on day one. Okay, and it still slides nice and easy. And the internal compartment here is made out of plywood, so we don't really expect that to swell or anything. So this drawer, you know, for the duration of its life, will probably slide perfectly. Yeah, this is usually how I spend my time in furniture stores. Anyway, while we were under here in the shop lighting, which is much better than the lighting inside the house, I noticed a little sort of hairline fracture. In fact, it's small. I, I, it's hard to... Okay, it's right here on the front where it looks like there's a little bit of a split. Now, I don't know how that's gonna affect this thing over the course of time, uh, but it definitely is something to keep my eye on. Now, why something like this would happen? No, I mean, the bottom line is wood has internal stresses on it, and as the seasons change, and you know, we laminated three, two or three pieces to get this leg to, to become as thick as it is anyway. So it's hard to say what causes those things, but the bottom line is, you have to know that they may happen, and it's just part of the game that we play. Uh, but it's not terrible, but I will keep my eye on it, and if it starts to spread, I may have to do something about it. Maybe take it back in the shop, sand it down a little bit, and uh, put in some uh, CA glue or something that might seep deep down and hold that together. Maybe even epoxy. Uh, but right now, it's not significant enough to even do anything to treat it at this point. Now, many of you may notice this piece. This is the crown jewel of my collection. This was featured in the beginning, I believe, of our first, uh, our first intro to the show, and it looked fantastic in that picture, didn't it? It's a good thing we got that picture when we did because it doesn't look so good now. Let me show you some great lessons, and this, this was one of my first, well, maybe my third project that I did, or second project that was like a serious woodworking project. I saw in a magazine they had this great plan for uh, a chessboard or a checkerboard in your case, in my case, because um, I don't know how to play chess. Uh, anyway, it was a chessboard with storage, hinged top. It was a really great design. You can make these cove moldings on the table saw, which was a new technique for me, and I thought it was great. The one thing I didn't like was the fact that the chessboard itself had a gap all the way around it, and I guess maybe I didn't read the instructions all the way through, and I was like, who would want a gap there? You know, it's just going to be a place where dust and dirt and things are going to fall. Why would I want to do that? So I made the top out of all solid pieces and I framed it with this beautiful walnut frame and I didn't realize what they were doing was putting a spline between the frame and the body of the chest piece, uh, the whole board, with some extra room to move so that as this piece expands, in this case it's going to expand and contract this way, as it does that it has the room to do it. I didn't give it that room. so. Let's take some close-up shots and show you some of the magic of wood movement. Now the way this is constructed, the sides were created as one piece and then we cut it last minute. You cut the top off and that creates the whole top portion. Now looking at the joint here on the side, this is pretty good. This held up really well. There's a biscuit holding it together. 
And I'd be pretty happy with that if that was everywhere. The problem is the top. Since I ignored the rules, this has separated dramatically. I don't know if you can see how we've got about a quarter inch separation where the wood has just decided, you know what, I'm stronger than this frame, I'm pushing my way through it. So we've got a gap that starts about here and increases significantly over there. And the miter here, although it's still together, it sort of just slid. Very interesting the way it split apart. And we've got one to match on the other side. Now right here, this one starts even further back and look at the size of that gap. And again, just pushed this frame piece forward. It didn't really separate it, so it's, it's a very interesting lesson here that that glue can still keep a grip, yet slide. So it's actually separated, yet the pieces haven't come apart completely, which is kind of amazing. Now, another interesting thing, and I'm guessing that my joinery and gluing skills weren't really that good at the time because there's a lot of separation on these actual squares themselves. I could feel major ridges and in fact I can separate the pieces with my fingers just by pushing. I have a feeling that if I push too hard uh, they would just kind of fall all over the place. So really um, embarrassing actually and I've tried to sell this at a yard sale a few different times. In fact I peeled off a ten dollar sticker off of it and I think I'm glad that it didn't sell and I'm glad it looked like crap and no one wants it because it's a, it's a really good lesson and reminder that I could pull out for occasions just like this to show you what happens when you break those rules. I mean, we talk about it all the time, right? We talk about wood movement and not violating those rules of wood movement and we try to follow the rules, but how often do we actually see a really great example of what happens when you ignore those rules and that's exactly what this is. So I think I'll keep it around. Uh, maybe it'll be, you know, just a little comic relief once in a while, but it is certainly a good lesson in wood movement. Now, as a professional woodworker, you might think that I know a little bit more about the final destination of the pieces that I create, but the reality is a lot of times you make something for someone and you never hear from them again. So you really don't know how that piece has held up over time. The only experimental pieces that I can monitor over the time are the ones that I make for family. And I really do use them as experiments. Every time I see them, I touch it and feel it and examine it and see what may have gone wrong over the course of time. And that's where I learn the most important lessons. So, uh, you know, as, as a new woodworker, you may be in even more of a trouble situation because you haven't made enough uh, projects to accumulate them in your house and use those as experimental pieces of furniture. So hopefully this gives you an idea of what things you can expect, uh, what things are normal and not normal, and uh, really a lot of it is just, it's just the way wood is. So if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go bury this in the backyard. Huh? You have a lid that, uh, let's uh, do that again. Oh, time. <laughs> what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Serious? <laughs> serious? Well, it looked, it looked, what the hell happened? <laughs> thanks for filling out the survey. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Stop You're this. just doing this to get clips.